Uh, we are uh, in week 10 of Know the Bible Now. Uh, this Know the Bible Now is a resource that came out of Concordia Publishing House uh, earlier this year. Uh, we sold about 130-some copies of it. I think there might be three more at the Welcome Center. And so for the last 10 weeks, we've been reading through it. It's a, what we've been calling a flyover of the Bible from Genesis to Revelation, some great uh, uh, articles, some great summa summations of each book of the Bible, some amazing uh, infographics. And we're coming to the end. We're going to conclude uh, next week. Uh, so you're at, in week 10 of your reading. If you've uh, been following along, again, we've got a study guide or reading guide that we've uh, included. Again, we didn't put any dates on it, so you can continue to read through this. I think it just gives a, a great, great overview. Uh, so many of you uh, who are uh, younger in your uh, 20s, 30s, and 40s and that, that have just been asking, um, how, how can we kind of get this picture? I mean, the Bible's this, this big book. There's all these stories, and we've heard them. There's pieces here and there, and how can we kind of put it? So this has been a, just a great resource to uh, fly over. Um, but before I get to uh, a little bit more on that, I, I do want to draw your attention um, in the announcements. The, uh, the, we talked about the inf information on the Stephen ministry. Uh, again, there's this great brochure that's in there. If you wouldn't, uh, if you'd please uh, read over that. And on the back, it talks about maybe at some point you might be willing to receive a spiritual care from a Stephen minister, or they might want to become and be trained to be a St Stephen minister. It's a huge system. That's one of our buzzwords this year, system. And again, uh, we've been talking about it over the last number of weeks. We'll continue to talk about it and uh, promote it. And this is going to be something that's going to be with our uh, church family for years and years and years and even into decades, as it has been in a, a number of other churches. So again, uh, this Know the Bible Now is something that we've been uh, using to promote what we keep talking about, and we're going to keep talking about it over and over again. It's the daily 15 minutes of chair time to read your Bible and do some praying. Just if this would become, and we'll teach on this concept at some point, but if it would become a keystone habit, a keystone habit that would just get, get, uh, be with you, 15 minutes every day in a chair, reading a little bit of your Bible and praying, just taking that, what we've been talking about, uh, uh, stop and step. So uh, uh, during each of these uh, um, 15 minutes a day, baby, Bible and faith stops. Bible and faith stops. Read the Bible and pray. Reading the Bible and praying. And then as you leave after that 15 minutes, you're going to be taking Bible and faith steps into each day. Bible and faith steps into each day. What you do in that 15 minutes stays with you throughout the day and into that night and into the next time that you do that. Last week we introduced this idea when we had our celebration of confirmation students and that of the Bible and faith stops, steps, and then this idea of fly. This idea of, of fly. Again, we've been using this Know the Bible Now to do this, what we've been calling a Bible flyover. And along this Bible flyover, there's going to be times that you stop and there's going to be time that you step, and then you just uh, kind of keep flying, but those stops that you're kind of flying past, you, you're going to re remember them. So this week, if again, if you follow this reading guide, we're going to be looking at the uh, Bible books of Romans and First and Second Corinthians. Then there's going to be a couple of articles about Paul and Silas in prison, again, the things that God did through them, even when they are in prison, and the people that came to faith because they were in prison. Uh, Paul sails to Rome, again, towards the end of his ministry and why that's... Then we're going to be looking at some of the uh, other books that Paul writes. He's going to write Galatians, Philippians, Colossians. Colossians is one of these huge letters of the New Testament that's huge here at New Hope. Uh, and Chris mentioned this idea of, uh, uh, of uh, chosen, holy, and dearly loved. That's from Colossians 3.12. We keep repeating that here. It's one of our driving values that we as people, if we keep hearing God saying you are chosen, holy, and dearly loved, you're God's chosen, and you're holy, and you're dearly loved. The world's not going to tell you that. Sometimes you're not going to tell, you tell yourself that. Maybe your mother didn't tell you that. Your father didn't tell you that. But God is telling us, I'm choosing you. I'm going to be making you holy, and I'm going to dearly love you. And we, whenever we teach that, we just say, go ahead and argue with God. But he's going to keep doing that. He's going to be relentless in a good way to choose us, to make us holy, and to dearly love us. 
And then um, uh, for our guests, we'll, we'll let you know what's going to happen. We have this weird thing that we do here at New Hope. At the end of every worship celebration, we go, Christ in us, the hope of glory. It's coming. Uh, and that's from Colossians 1, 27. We didn't invent, we invented this, but the words, Christ in us, the hope of glory, those are words that are just have taken root in us over and over again. And the idea of Christ is in us. Whew. And that he is the hope of glory. We're going to be talking about that in a few minutes. And then uh, this week also you'll go over the books of First and Second Timothy. This, this morning for our Mother's Day, we'll get to it in just a minute. We're going to look at one verse from Second Timothy. And going to launch off from that verse and see what God does uh, with that verse in us today. And then this uh, next week, you're going to be looking at Titus, 1st and 2nd and 3rd John, then Jude, and then the last book of the Bible, Revelation. And if you come next Sunday, uh, we're going to be talking about Revelation as we conclude our 10-week series of Know the Bible Now. And so I'm going to answer all of your questions next week about this wonderful book of Revelation. No, I'm not, but... Uh, well, and so, so then a couple of articles uh, as it comes to the end of this Know the Bible Now. It's six visions point to one end. In this book of Revelation, there's six different visions, but each vision concludes with one end. And so there's a great article uh, about that. And then the last uh, article is John's vision of heaven. Because the revelation is John is in heaven and he writes with human words, with God's inspirational Words as much as we can take in, and then uh, stirs our faith with that. So again, next Sunday, Revelation, and uh, we'll be thinking about this idea of how do we, how do we, um, that God is speaking to us, but He's also speaking to our fellow brothers and sisters all around the world, and some of our brothers and sisters live in unimaginable persecution. So refugee crisis that every once in a while maybe you're tracking with in the news, a lot of those are our brothers and sisters who not by choice had to leave their the homes that they, that they knew, children living in conditions that we can't imagine. How can we as the Big C Church be a part of praying and supporting and serving some of those people that aren't choosing to live as they're living, but God is still with them. So next week as we look at Revelation, we're also going to be uh, looking at a phrase that I've been teaching and I've been practicing uh, for years and years and years, this idea of every passing day, every passing day, we are one day closer to glory. Every passing day, we are one day closer to glory. That's who, as we are followers of Jesus, every passing day, we're one day closer to glory. And we say that around here in uh, using this phrase oftentimes, and again, you heard it during the announcements, that God's kingdom is ever warmly, I'm going to come back to that in a moment, God's kingdom is ever warmly expanding in us, and then through us, and all around us, and then way beyond us. God's kingdom is ever warmly expanding in us, through us, all around us, and way beyond us. So every day is one day closer to glory. And we will always teach that glory, glory, glory is warm. Imagine what John helps us to do in Revelation. Imagine that glory will never be too hot, like we almost were on Friday, and will never be too cold, like sometimes it is in January. Glory is always warm. So as we imagine, every passing day is one day closer to glory. So God's kingdom is ever warmly expanding in us, through us, all around us, and way beyond us. So on this Mother's Day, that's happening too. So on this Mother's Day, uh, again, going way back, and, uh, but also updating and revising uh, my favorite Mother's Day joke. So... Are you ready for my favorite Mother's Day joke? I'm going to tell it anyway. So some of you know, again, for our guests, just to give you a real quick overview on that. Um, so I'm, I'm married. We have three adult children, and our oldest daughter has blessed us with three grandchildren. 
her and her uh, husband is blessed us with three grandchildren. Ella, who's six years old, she's in kindergarten and about ready to wrap up her year, their year. They just had a wonderful, uh, lovely Mother's Day tea on Friday. And our uh, grandson, Jackson, he's uh, five and he's in uh, preschool with Ama. And then our son, our grandson, Bryce, who's uh, three years old. And um, so uh, in this new revamped Mother's Day uh, version of this uh, classic tale, um, Emily and Jackson and Bryce are shopping at Costco. Ella and Daddy are hanging out somewhere. And so they get their stuff in the cart, and Jackson is helping push the cart, and Bryce is riding in the cart. And they get up to the checkout counter, and so uh, Emily's in front of the cart, kind of unloading some of the stuff on the, on the conveyor belt. And right in front of Emily, there's this huge mountain of a man. I mean, he is like six foot eight, probably 300 pounds, maybe even bigger than that, just huge, wide shoulders. So uh, Bryce is sitting in the cart, and Jackson's behind the cart, and they catch this big mountain of the man kind of casting a shadow on their little diminutive mother. And this man, this big mountain of a man, his cell phone goes off, and his ringtone sounds like a dump truck backing up. It goes beep, beep, beep. And Jackson's eyes get really big. He says, Mommy, watch out. He's backing up. <laughs> so that's the classic Mother's Day joke, a little bit revised and revamped. And Bryce could be heard as they go out the door that day, Mommy, that wheelie freaked me out. So today I want to tell some uh, stories of mothers and this idea of mothers taking stops, Bible and faith stops, Bible and faith steps, and that eventually these mothers fly with all the stops and all the steps of the Bible and faith. In 2 Timothy chapter 1 verse 5, we get this one verse and it says this, I've been reminded of your sincere faith. And we're going to be thinking about those two words, sincere faith. Would you say those two words with me, please? Sincere faith. Which first lived in your grandmother Lois and in your mother Eunice, and I am persuaded now lives in you also. So the Apostle Paul is writing to Timothy. He's a pastor, a young pastor. He's been discipled. He's been uh, mentored by Apostle Paul. Apostle Paul is somewhere else in Timothy, where he lives, um, is pastoring there. And Paul writes the two of these letters. We have 1 Timothy and 2 Timothy. And 2 Timothy reminds him in these opening words of this first chapter that, you know, Timothy, the faith that is in you, this sincere faith that's in you, I see it in you, but I trace it back to seeing how it was um, given to you a little bit by your mother, and also stirred in you by your grandmother. Paul also obviously has some input in that, as probably others do, but Paul makes this point of, it was in your grandmother, sincere faith. It was in your mother, sincere faith. And now it's in you. So on this uh, Mother's Day, I want us to think about this Bible and faith, stop, steps, fly. And I want us to think about Grandmother Lois, and Mother Eunice. And actually, we're probably going to think more about Grandmother Lois in a moment. First of all, this. Did Lois and Eunice know how to read and write? Probably not. Probably not. But when we ask this question, did Lois and Eunice know Bible and faith stories? And the answer would be a resounding yes. Oh, man, they knew the Bible and faith stories without ever having picked up a copy of any of the books of the Old Testament, any of the scrolls, but they knew the Bible and faith stories told from generation to generation, people oftentimes who did not know how to read or to write. But sincere faith is in each one of them. So if we were to imagine Lois when she was a little girl, 11, 12 years old, 
before she was married, before she had any children. Didn't live in Jerusalem, but lived in the nation of Israel. Maybe out somewhere in a little rural village, around water. That's where people would mostly uh, get around, always a source of water. She would have lived in just a little, what we would call a shack. It would have had dirt floors. It's before the time of Jesus, before he is born. So we're talking B.C. here. So maybe uh, she was born, I'll say, 70 years before the time of Jesus. The nation of Israel would already have been under Roman occupation at that time. As an 11- and 12-year-old girl, she would know about Roman taxation. She would know some of the stories of the oppression of Romans and some of the things that happened at times from Roman soldiers to girls that were just a few years older than her. She would know for a good majority of the year, barely having enough food to take the pain of hunger away. At harvest time, there'd be these feasts and their bellies would be full, but there'd be all these other weeks and months when they weren't able to go to the refrigerator or to a freezer. When it comes to meat, boy, maybe a couple times a year, maybe at one of the celebrations, there would be uh, enough meat that they would all get a little bit. And so she knows a very hard life, a life that for us to imagine it's pretty much a stretch. But she knew stories of the Bible and faith, maybe better than we know them, even though we can read them. She knew that she was a descendant, a child of faith, a daughter of faith from the ancestor Abraham. She knew the story of Abraham, that he lived in a faraway country and God called him over to eventually what would be known as the promised land where she now lived. And she knew the story that he was 75 years old when God called him. She would know the stories of uh, Sarah, but how it was that God made this huge promise. He even one time took him out at night, took Abraham out at night, spoke to him and said to Abraham, come out here at night and look up at the stars and count them if you can because your descendants will number more than what you can see in the stars. And she would know the story of Abraham, sometimes he struggled being a man of faith. So when year and year and year and year and year went by and a decade went by and almost another decade went by and Sarah didn't get pregnant and Sarah didn't get pregnant and Sarah didn't get pregnant, all these other women around getting pregnant, all these, then Sarah says, why don't we help out God? Here's my handmaiden, Hagar. Why don't you have a child with him? She knows, Lois knows difficulties that came because of that. Whenever we try to help God, whenever we try to help God, even today, it usually goes bad. She knew those stories. But yet God still did his work through Abraham and Sarah and that son Isaac. She would know the story of Isaac and Rebekah when they got married. She would know the stories of the twins that they had, Jacob and Esau, and all the crazy stuff that happens between those two, but yet God works through that. And God would give Jacob, who we would know as Israel, God changes his name. Sometimes God changes people's names, and he would know, we know him as Jacob in Israel. He has 12 sons, and one of those sons is Joseph, and he goes down into Egypt as a slave and for a couple of decades goes by and he had this dream when he was young and he's got all this misery, all this suffering, all these things that happen, the oppression that happens till his dreams come true and his brothers come down and they bow down in front of him. And his father comes down. And they'll spend the next 400 years in Egypt. She knows those stories. She knows the stories of Moses and the 10 plagues and them crossing the Red Sea. She knows all the stories of the kings and of the prophets. She has a sincere faith. And it's not easy. Again, this is what I'd call, you know, kind of holy speculation. 
But Lois has a sincere faith. And possibly one of her children died soon after birth. Maybe another child died. And another. And another. And that Eunice is still alive and maybe one or two others. But she thanks God that she was able to be a mother to pass her sincere faith onto her daughter. Maybe when Lois was, again, this 11, 12 years old, another thing happened that would stir her to have the sincere faith. A rabbi visit, visited their village one time. Again, in these small little villages where they would be able to form these little synagogues, believers, where they would kind of kind of stir off stir sincere faith and pass story after story after story after story. Every once in a while, they would get a traveling rabbi that would come and help them to learn a portion of the scriptures, to memorize a portion of the scriptures. And she was allowed, her and her family and other little villagers, they got to come and hear this rabbi. And he spoke to them and taught them from one psalm in the Old Testament. Psalm 136. And these are the words. Give thanks to the Lord for he is good. His love endures forever. Give thanks to the God of gods. His love endures forever. Give thanks to the Lord of lords. His love endures forever. And for 26 more verses, there's these this first line, and then always his love endures forever, his love endures forever, his love endures forever. And that got planted so deep into Lois's heart. She stopped, and the Bible and faith took a hold of her. She stepped, no matter what life, no matter what came her way in her life. His love endures forever. Now, so many years later, maybe a few decades later, there's her daughter and her grandson, Timothy, and she flies over. His love endures forever. His love endures forever. His love endures forever. Maybe not long after Timothy gets this letter from Paul, she passes to glory. But her sincere faith went into her daughter, went into her grandson, went into the people that Timothy served as a pastor, maybe went into his own children, we don't know. But it keeps going from generation to generation, from place to place to place. And we're here today because of sincere faith. How many of our stories, how many of our stories have the sincere faith of a grandmother or a mother. Again, these words of 2 Timothy, I have been reminded of your sincere faith, which first lived in your grandmother Lois and in your mother Eunice, and I am now persuaded also lives in you. How many stories of our sincere faith have been influenced by grandmothers, by mothers, by grandfathers, by fathers, by coaches, by teachers, by people serving children, teens, and young adults? Today, as we know, is Mother's Day, and there are some mothers here that have sincere faith. And some of you are children of those mothers that have sincere faith. So maybe you might want to look at your mother at some point today and just say, yes. I see it in you. Yes, I see it in you. Because sincere faith is warm faith. And so it is that we see and experience God's kingdom ever warmly expanding in us, through us, all around us, and way beyond us. So again, next week, I'm going to wrap this up. Next week, Know the Bible Now, Conclusion, Revelation, Refugee, Sunday. Again, it's the idea that every passing day, we're one day closer to glory, closer to warm. God's kingdom is ever warmly expanding in us, through us, all around us, and way beyond us. And I close with these two questions. Who has had... Or is having influence and you having the gift of sincere faith? Who has had or is having influence on you having the gift of sincere faith? And who might you influence sharing the gift 
of your sincere faith. Any of us in this room who has sincere faith, we didn't generate it all by ourselves. God has moved in our lives through mothers, grandmothers, and others that we would have sincere faith, warm faith. So 2,000 years since the time of Lois, we consider these words. I have been reminded of your sincere faith which first lived in your grandmother Lois and in your mother Eunice, and I am persuaded now lives in you also. Bible and faith stops, steps, fly. One day, we'll be able to stop in heaven and sit with Lois and hear her whole story. If all of her Bible stops, all of her Bible steps, she'll fly with us. And we'll fly together with sincere faith, with warm faith. Let's stand, let's pray. We'll sing one more song. We'll go into the rest of our Mother's Day. So Jesus, we know that the Bible tells us that you had a mother of sincere faith. She had Bible steps and Bible stops. More than likely, your mother, Jesus, also could not read or write. But she had sincere faith. That probably came from her mother and maybe her grandmother. And a great-grandmother and a great-great-grandmother. So we are so amazed at the people of faith and how sincere faith goes from one generation to another generation to another generation. We're so grateful that sincere faith has found its way into our hearts, into our lives, and into our stories. And we're so grateful that we can see and be convinced that sincere faith is being stirred in our children and in our grandchildren and our prayers for great-grandchildren. So Jesus, the wonder of you, the grace of you, the warmth of you, we pray it all in your name. Amen.